Hello everyone, this is Terry Erzman. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Percona. Uh, if you can hear me, would you uh, please raise your hand? Okay, I see a few hands up there. Thanks everyone. Um, we will be recording today's broadcast and we'll send out a, re, a link to the recording of the webinar later uh, today or early tomorrow. If you have any questions during the presentation today, please uh, post them to the questions section of your uh, GoToWebinar um, uh, control panel. We will uh, address as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce Baron Schwartz. Percona's Chief Performance Architect, and Baron will be speaking on Explain Demystified. Baron? Thanks, Terry. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you're having a good day. Uh, as Terry mentioned, go ahead and ask those questions. Terry's going to be moderating them. I'm happy to answer them either at the end, if there's time, or if it's something that seems appropriate to the moment, uh, go ahead and address it right now um, so we don't have to flip back and forth through a whole bunch of slides. So I have a confession. I realized that I forgot to put an introductory slide about Percona. So we'll just leave this slide up and I'll tell you a little bit about ourselves for a moment while some more people join. We provide services and support and engineering for the MySQL database server and related derivatives of it such as Percona server, MariaDB, and Drizzle. And uh, we also run a series of conferences and we run training where the uh, my, my two colleagues and I are the three authors of High Performance MySQL 3rd Edition and uh, with a couple of other people of High Performance MySQL 2nd Edition. The 3rd Edition should be coming out in um, less than a month. It should be available. Uh, we also provide a wide variety of free software and, and tools for MySQL users including a toolkit that's pretty much widely acknowledged as something every serious MySQL administrator needs to use, and Percona Extra Backup, which is a non-blocking backup solution for MySQL and NODB data. So with that introduction out of the way, I'll get right going with the slides. So today I want to talk about MySQL's explain command. Um, most of you are probably familiar with it, and most database servers have some kind of a explain command. In fact, it's usually called explain, although it's not always. And um, I find it very cryptic, or, or I used to find it very cryptic, especially when I was new to MySQL. My background was in uh, Microsoft SQL Server before I came to MySQL. And um, I, I found Microsoft SQL Server's query analysis and uh, execution plan display to be very intuitive and very helpful for understanding why queries performed the way they did. And MySQL's explain just didn't do a thing for me. I thought it was very cryptic and it actually took me a year or so and talking to some of the MySQL optimizer developers at one of the presentations at the MySQL conference before the lights kind of came on and I understood how it's structured and, and how it's generated. And that's what I'm going to try and, and share with you today is where explain comes from and how you can read it because it's, again, I find it not very intuitive. So uh, we'll have sort of a roundabout trip to get there. We'll first talk about how MySQL executes queries. And with that information in mind, we can see how the execution plan maps into the explain output and therefore how you can go backwards. Um, and at the end, I'll show you some advanced features of explain and some helpful tools that can make your life with explain a little bit easier. And I have a few slides of resources at the end. And these slides will be posted online as well. I'm not sure whether they'll just be uh, part of the webinar recording or if we'll post them separately, but they will be available one way or another. So what is explain? It, it shows how MySQL thinks or, or um, anticipates that it's going to execute a query. And this is not the, the a true execution plan that MySQL might choose. In many cases it is, but it might not be. There might be cases where MySQL thinks that it's going to execute a certain way, but then when it gets started with a query, it finds out that the values that it's examining are different than it thought, for example, and so it may actually reevaluate and replan the query at times as it goes. And, and, and sometimes you can even see in advance that MySQL knows that it's going to have to replan the query for every value that it retrieves from a table, for example. If it's doing a join from one table into another and it doesn't really know which index is going to be best, 
thinks that different indexes might be best uh, depending on the values that it retrieves from the first table. It might actually switch around and reevaluate the index to use every time it looks for rows in the second table. So it's, it's only an estimate, um, and it's only for select. So you, you use the explain command by saying explain select and then say the rest of your, expect, uh, your select statement after that. And you can work around this to some extent. For example, you can explain an update by kind of transforming it into a select that looks roughly equivalent. The problem with that is that the query execution plan inside of MySQL might not actually be the same thing. And there are lots and lots of cases where an update will execute one way and a select that looks relatively equivalent to that will execute a different way entirely. So uh, those are kind of some some limitations and characteristics to keep in mind when you're looking at, at explain. Unlike some other database servers, you can't say explain execute or explain analyze. Um, you can't, uh, to go back to my example of Microsoft SQL Server, you could get the estimated execution plan or you could set show plan on and run the uh, query, actually execute the plan, execute the query and then see what the actual plan was after the fact. You can't do that with MySQL. You can't really see how the query executed after the fact. There are some ways that you can look at some status counters and things like that, but it's not the same thing. So explain is an estimate, again, of how MySQL thinks that it's going to optimize, uh, optimize and execute the query. And there's something I mentioned here. It's only for select. Um, but that is changing in MySQL 5.6. You will actually be able to say explain update, explain delete, explain insert, and explain replace. So, so that's only a limitation in MySQL 5.5 and previous. So here's the output of a fairly typical simple explain query. Here I'm using the Sequila sample database that you can download from the MySQL documentation website. And I'm just selecting the title column from the film table and I'm looking for a particular film ID 5. So there should be one row here. There should only be one film with the ID 5. And I've formatted the query with the backslash capital G at the end instead of a semicolon. What that does is it causes the, uh, the resulting output to be ver vertically formatted. So each, row, each, each line in the output below is actually a column. The, the column or output that you might be looking for is kind of turned on its side. So the first column there is the ID column, and then we have the select type column and the table column and so forth and so on. And I'll kind of come back to this as we go. This will be sort of a running example that I'll use as a reference point as we go through. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about execution plans and how we end up uh, generating the explain output. So MySQL's execution process, very broadly speaking, I mean, we're, we're painting with a very broad brush and making lots of simplifications here is that it parses SQL, converts that into a data structure called the parse tree, and then transforms the parse tree into the execution plan. And the uh, executor, or sometimes called executioner, works from that data structure, works from the execution plan. It iterates through the structure, um, navigating from part to part in the execution plan data structure and executing the specified storage engine API calls on each node in that data structure. Now this is very different from how most database servers execute a, a query. Most database servers will compile the query plan into bytecode, that is machine code that can run, natively run on the, on the processor, on the CPU. MySQL does not do that. Um, it starts with a data structure that comes out of the parse process and then it just transforms that into another data structure. Um, optimizations, for example, become changes to the, the tree structure of the um, execution plan, constant folding, all of those kinds of, uh, there's a lot of optimizations that go on that look very much like what a compiler does, but it's not really compiling. It's simply tweaking the, uh, the execution plan data structure into a different data structure and then it's, it's iterating over and, and traversing that data structure as it does its work. So the execution plan is another thing that is uh, perhaps a little bit um, 
counterintuitive sometimes for people. If we have a three-table join, like I've shown at the top of the, of the slide here, where we're selecting from Sakila film, joining to film actor, and then joining to actors, we're, we're joining through a relationship table in the middle. One of the possible strategies there is that the join operator might have three inputs, as I've shown on the bottom left here. It might be retrieving data from all three of those and munging them together. And in computer science terminology, this is what we would call a bushy tree or a balanced tree. This is too small of a tree really to say how exactly it should be described. But um, the characteristic that we're missing here, which I want to demonstrate to you on the next, um, sorry, next, not previous slide, is that MySQL actually uses a data structure called a, a left deep tree or a left linear tree. And that means that from left to right, from bottom to top, it begins with film and film actor and then joins them. And then the output of that becomes the input uh, to a further join into the actor table. And I could, have, um, I could have done a very tall join with lots and lots of tables here to kind of demonstrate this. But basically, you always begin with two tables, um, and you get one result from that, and then you join it to something else. And so every join always has two inputs. You don't have joins with three inputs. And uh, if you make a, a many-way join here, you'll end up with a tall, diagonal-looking tree that slopes towards the right. And how this turns into explain is if you, if you rotate that tree structure 90 degrees clockwise, 90 degrees to the right, and then start at what used to be the bottom left and read down it, you see those tables in order, film, film actor, actor. MySQL will actually print out one row in the table of explain output for each table in the uh, query execution plan. So if it begins with film and film actor and joins them together and then joins into actor, you're going to see those come out in the explain output uh, in that order. There are some cases in which the order is not completely uh, obvious and sometimes things get a little bit reorganized depending on more complicated query execution plans, but in general, this is the rule. If you read the explain output from top to bottom, you're looking at the join order. First film, then probing into film actor, then into actor. So that's, for me, that, that transformation, that visualizing the tree and then rotating it 90 degrees to the right, that was when the light bulb came on in my head and I realized where this explain output was kind of coming from. Um, I don't know if that's a transformative moment for you, <laughs> uh, but it was for me. So I hope that's a helpful visualization to understanding how Explain is, is created. Generating that output actually, um, it's an estimated execution plan. What you see, the output of Explain is estimated, but it's actually generated by executing that, that query plan with a special bit set. And the bit, I, I can't remember actually what the bit is called anymore, but it's something like do not execute or explain only. And MySQL will actually execute the query and um, print out rows in that result set output into explain for every operation or, or for the operations that the designers considered important enough to, to generate a row. And each row in the output is technically in the internals documentation and in the MySQL developers nomenclature, it's called a join. So every one of those rows of output, film, film actor, actor, those are called joins. And you'll see that in the MySQL reference manual as well. There's, uh, there's reference to the join type for every row in the output of explain. There's a couple of consequences from the way that MySQL generates this explain output. The first is that because it actually executes the query, it really actually executes the query. Most of the time, uh, that's kind of a no-op because that bit is set that says don't do anything. But this is not necessarily true for subqueries. Subqueries that uh, require a materials, materialized temporary table as a step in the input to the uh, execution plan will actually cause MySQL to execute that subquery, fill a temporary table with the results. And, uh, and then re-execute the outer query against the subquery. 
So if you explain a query against a, I'm sorry, if you explain a query that has a subquery, sometimes you'll see explain takes a long time to finish. And that's because it is executing that inner query and filling the table, and then it finally explains the outer query against the results of the inner query. So just something to keep in mind, and I'll show a couple of examples of that later. So back to our canonical example, I'm going to start going through the columns in the explain output one at a time. So here I'm showing a single table select, uh, so we have a single join, quote unquote, in the output here, and that, that results in a single row of output. And I'm going to work through these columns from the top to the bottom, from ID, select type, table, all the way down to rows and extra. So let's, let's begin with ID. The ID column indicates uh, what kind of a select the row begins to and which select it begins to. A little bit later we'll see what kind, but for right now the ID is actually a numeric. It's one, two, three, and so forth. And it indicates which select in the entire query uh, the particular row comes from. So if you have a simple query like I just showed you, there is only one select. If you have subqueries, there will be more than one select, and you can read through the, the query from left to right, from beginning to end, and as you encounter those selects, as you scan through the text, the first select that you encounter is going to be numbered one, the next one is going to be numbered two, and so forth and so on. So they're sequentially assigned. And if you only have a, a single, of course, then it's one. Um, if you have a, a more complex type of a query, there are two broad classes of queries that you can consider. You have simple and you have complex types. The simple type is what you used to be able to do in MySQL um, three, version 3, <laughs> before version 4 introduced subqueries and, and unions. So subqueries and unions are considered these um, complex types. There's also a couple of different types of subqueries. So in MySQL 4, we begin to see complex types being introduced, and explain had to become a little bit more uh, convoluted in order to accommodate the, the more complicated types of output that, um, to match the more complicated types of query execution that MySQL was doing. So we'll see how that kind of got shoehorned into explain a little bit later. So the three subtypes of complex, I kind of glossed over that. First we have a subquery. Then we have a derived table, which is a special type of a subquery. Technically, a derived table actually means something different in the SQL standard, but most of the people that I've been around use derived table as a synonym for a subquery in the from clause. And then finally, the union. So those are the three cases where we have um, differing values in the ID column. And I'll show you examples of all three of them so we can kind of see what the differences are. So when we have a subquery, for example, here we have a subquery that's in the select list, and this subquery generates a single value um, that turns into a, a, a column in the output. What you have then is that the, uh, the outer select is numbered one, and then the subquery is numbered two, and you can see that at the bottom of the screen. The subquery's got that ID two next to it and it's the, the one that's selecting from actor, so that, that is the inner select there. So that's the sequential numbering. And then when we have a so-called derived table, this is a, a, a subquery in the from clause. So you, hear, you see here that we've got from and then a select inside of that. This is executed inside of MySQL as a temporary table. It's invisible and it's implicit. You don't see it, you don't control it. Um, MySQL creates this temporary table, executes the inner query, puts the results into that temporary table, and then re-evaluates, re-optimizes, um, re re-executes, and explains the outer query against it. So that's why it's called a derived table, because the, the temporary table that results from that subquery is derived from the subquery. Now I've aliased the, uh, the derived table as DER here, and if you look in the select output, you won't see that. I'm sorry, the explain output, you won't see that. It's not referenced by its alias. Instead, what happens is that um, the, the join with ID2 is the bottom most one on this slide. It's the derived table against film. And the, uh, the one just above it, the primary, 
ID 1 is selecting from a table that's called angle bracket derived to angle bracket. And we'll see what that notation means a little bit later. So this is the second type of complex query that we might see um, sort of different values in the ID column. And then finally in a union, we actually have a null in the ID column. And what happens is that we select one and then we select one again. And those become, uh, those become IDs one and two in the output of explain. And then finally we have an ID that's null that reads the result of the two branches of that union. So here what's happening is that MySQL actually creates a temporary table for unions as well. And it always does this, by the way, even when it doesn't necessarily have to. For example, there are specific types of unions that MySQL could potentially just stream the results from the first table, then add on the results from the second table and so forth and send all that to the client as soon as it's ready. But it never does that. In fact, it always creates a temporary table and puts the results from the union into the temporary table. And then the final step is to read the temporary table back out again and send the results to the client. And so that's what we see happening here. Number one is putting results into the temporary table. Number two is doing the same. And then this final null union result is reading from one and two. And you see the, uh, the table there the notation angle bracket union one comma two angle bracket. And that's again what it's doing. It's kind of referring to IDs one and two. And we'll see again more clear examples of that later as I explain some of the more columns that we're getting to. So the next column, the, the second column and explains output is the select type. And in this example on the screen right now, the select type is simple. So we've got a, a very simple uh, uh, select up above. There can be more complicated types. Um, I mentioned the three types of complex. There are the subqueries, subqueries in the from clause, and the unions. There's a special rule for the union. Um, when a select is part of a union, you'll see that the, the first contained select has a select type that matches the, the outermost context, if you will. Let me back up two slides, and that might become clearer. So if we look here, usually a simple query will have primary as its select type. And that happens in a union too. The first branch of the union is labeled primary because that's kind of the, um, the, the enclosing context for a union. The second branch of the union will have the, the select type labeled union. So the special rule for unions is that the first row that comes out always matches whatever the outer context is. And the outer context might not be primary. Primary indicates a topmost select, uh, but in some cases, such as when uh, a union is inside of some other, let's say a derived table, um, that first row of output for the union will have the, the, uh, the select type value as derived instead of as primary. And we might see um, some dependency or some uncacheability. So we might see, for example, dependent subquery. And those are kind of modifiers that are tacked on as a word in front of the select type. And they refer to, um, they refer to kind of a variation on the same kind of a query plan for that particular row in the select output. Uncacheability does not refer to the query cache. It refers to something called the item cache, which is invisible. An item inside of MySQL is anything that can be the result of an expression. So the value one, the, the literal number one, can be an expression. Uh, um, I'm saying that a little bit confusingly. It's, it's anything that evaluates to a value after a MySQL um, executes it. So the literal one executes to the value one. But a subquery could also evaluate to a specific value. And so can a function such as min or max. And all of those things are handled inside of the MySQL source code with a class called item, which is very um, widely used throughout the source code and has many, many subclasses in it. If you're familiar with C++ coding conventions, it has lots and lots of subclasses. And the item cache is a special cache that helps avoid re-evaluating and re-executing an item if it's possible. If it's not possible, then you might see uncacheable subquery, for example, and that indicates that the item cache has been disabled for some reason, so that that expression will have to be re-evaluated. So the table column, uh, that's the next in our select output, shows either the table name or its alias, or in more complicated cases, 
um, you'll see derived n or union n comma n comma n. So we saw previously derived two, and uh, we saw previously also union one comma two, and those can get arbitrarily large. Um, if they do get too large, unions might have some values truncated out of the middle, but you'll still have the end of the union to look at. So you can figure out exactly which IDs were included in that union. So here's a pretty complicated example that wraps it all together. On the, uh, the first row, we've got primary. And um, that's apparently reading from something called derived three. We have a derived query, a, a derived table after that, which appears to have maybe a dependent subquery inside of it, and then a union, and we've got another derived and subquery and an uncacheable subquery, and then finally a union result. And if you look along the ID column here on the left, you'll see that those are out of order. One, three, two, four, six, seven, five. It's kind of a funny order. That ordering actually ends up being extremely important for figuring out the real order in which these things execute and which things depend on which other things. So if we look here at derived three and derived six in the table column, what that actually means is that uh, instead of selecting from a table called derived three, it's selecting from the temporary table which was created by um, whatever query begins with ID equals three. So there's some derived table there that's creating a temporary table from which the first row is selecting. And the fourth row looks like the second branch of a union, and that's selecting from something called derived six. Well, if we look where uh, the row where ID equals six, we'll see another derived table there. Looks like it's selecting from the film table, and then it's got maybe a subquery and an uncacheable subquery inside of it. And then finally, all the way at the bottom, I think I've got another set of little green boxes to highlight this. Yeah, all the way at the bottom, we've got union one comma four, which means that the final phase of executing this query is reading from a two-branch union, the results of which are stored in or uh, indicated by IDs 1 and 4. So what's really happening here is that we have what looks like a kind of a complicated nested query going on with a few derived tables and a union that wraps the entire thing um, in an overall uh, operation. So here is the SQL that created that. and you can execute this against the standard Sakila database and you should get something similar on current versions of MySQL. Uh, so you, you can see that, as I said, we do have a union that's right in the middle there, union all. And we've got two branches to the union. Each of those has a subquery and each of them has a derived subquery. And one of the, this, the, second, um, the second branch of the union here has a, a subquery with at var one, so that's a user variable, and that defeats caching, that defeats the item cache, similar to the way that it might defeat the query cache, which is why we saw um, uncacheable subquery in the row where the ID five here, uncacheable subquery means that that variable at var one was preventing that expression from being cached, and it has to be reevaluated every time. So this is something that you can kind of you know, flip back and forth and trace the bits here and there. It's too complicated and too noisy. Um, this is the simplest example that I could find, but it's still too much to put onto a single slide. So I can't really show you the query and the output side by side and, and draw arrows from one to the other to explain where things are coming from. But if you're interested in that, you know, you can flip back and forth through the slides and, and puzzle over it. When things get more complicated, when you have, you know, 10-way queries with a whole bunch of subqueries and things like that, it can be really painful and, and very confusing to sort of reverse engineer, explain, and kind of understand how the explain maps back to the query. I did write a tool for that. Uh, it's part of Percona Toolkit, and I'll show you later uh, towards the end of our slides. Let's keep going with the columns. So the type column explains how MySQL estimates that it's going to find rows in the table. And the documentation, the, the MySQL reference manual calls this the join type. I like to call it the access type because I think it's easier for people to understand that. The join type is kind of the terminology that, that server developers would use when they're talking with each other because of the internal source code structuring and the conventions used there. 
But for a user, it's more straightforward and simpler to think of the access type, how MySQL is going to find rows in a table. And from worst to best, we have a table scan where it just scans through the entire table looking for rows. Um, or we could use an, um, an index, scan an entire index, which is kind of like a full table scan, except that it's only a full index scan. Or we could scan a range of an index. Or we could use a, a, a value as a reference to look into an index and find rows in the index that match that reference value. Uh, a variation on the reference is the equal reference, which means that there's going to be at most one, so that's a unique index or a primary key. We know there's only going to be the possibility of exactly one value in that index. Or a constant, or something called system, which means that MySQL has completely, um, during the, the optimization phase itself, it has determined that it can replace this access to this table with uh, a constant and include that constant in the rest of the query as though it wasn't a table at all. For example, sometimes you might see selecting the maximum value from an indexed column. MySQL can seek to the, index, to the end of the index during the execution planning phase and find out what the maximum volume, value in that column is. And then instead of referring to the, the query against the index later in the query, can actually refer to that value. So a good example here is if I wanted to do some kind of a, a, a join that involved joining against the maximum actor ID in this Aquila.actor table. During the planning phase, MySQL could say, well, what is that value? And it's, I don't remember exactly what it is. It's maybe actor 550 or something like that. There's not all that many actors in that table. Um, but let's suppose that it's 550. Throughout the rest of query planning and execution, MySQL will treat that as the, the constant value 550. And then null means that the, uh, there's no table at all involved. So if you say select one, you'll see null. There's, there's no, uh, no table there involved at all. In the example on the bottom of the screen here, I'm selecting something. It doesn't really matter what, but it's a simple, simple query against the film table. And we see that the type is range. That means that it's going to be accessing some range of values in the type column, uh, in, the, uh, in the film table. So it's not the whole index. It's not from beginning to end. But there's going to be some where clause or something like that that's going to constrain it to a range of values, one or more rows. Actually, more, more correctly, zero or more rows. There might not be any matching, but multiple rows. And then the, uh, there's three columns that relate to what index MySQL is going to use to find its values in the table. So possible keys mentions which indexes are candidates. And sometimes MySQL will actually use a, an index that wasn't listed as a candidate here because um, the decision of which things are candidates is decided one point in the source code. And then somewhere else there's an optimization that says, well, you know, but we could actually use this other index even though it's not useful for the where clause, and it's not useful for this and that and the other thing, but it might be useful because it contains, let's say, all of the columns that the query needs to access. So we'll use that one instead. So sometimes you might see that it, uh, an index is mentioned in key, which is the second column listed here, but it's not in possible keys. In my example on the bottom of the page here, the possible keys is primary. The key is primary, which means that MySQL selected that key, uh, key or index, key and index are synonyms in MySQL. And the key len is how many bytes from the left edge of the, uh, of the index MySQL is going to use. So if this were, for example, a multiple column index, it might have a couple of integers and a date and a character column or something like that, it could have a lot of bytes in that uh, index. The index width might be you know, hundreds, of, hundreds of bytes wide. But you might see that MySQL is only using, let's say, the first two as it is here, or the first eight, or three, or six, or something like that, bytes of the index. And what that means is that it's not using all of the columns of the index. Let's say that we have a compound index on an integer and a date, and you give MySQL a query with a WHERE clause on the integer. Integers are four bytes by default. So what you'll see is four bytes in key len column, 
even though the full width of the index uh, of the index um, is four plus three because uh, the integer is four bytes wide and a date is stored in three bytes. So you can look at that and you can say, well, looks like MySQL is only using part of the index, not the whole thing. The ref column is the next one. And here I'm starting to show you more you know, complicated queries and a little bit more of the explain output as we go. The ref column means when something is looked up in an index, when MySQL is seeking for rows that match a value, where does it get that value from? So here we've got our our um, familiar actor, film actor, and uh, film join. And MySQL is uh, finding something. Let me move my. Uh, need to move the the go to webinar control panel a little bit here. There we go. It was obscuring part of what I wanted to look at. It's finding something in the sequila.f table and using that to look up values in the, in the primary key in that last row of output there, the FA row. So I've aliased this, these tables, uh, sequila.film as F, sequila.film actor as FA, and sequila.actor as A. And what you see is that in the, in the explain output, it's actually looking into the actor table. It's looking for, uh, it's looking in the primary key for something that matches a constant. Now there's a couple of things that might be a little bit surprising here. First of all, if you look at the query, it says explain select straight join. Straight join is supposed to make MySQL execute things in the order that you specify. That is in the order that you write them in the query. So this is kind of one of those hints that's supposed to help you tell the query optimizer, look, I know the order that you should join these things and do it as I say. Don't reorder the, the query for efficiency. Don't try and second guess. But in the particular version of MySQL that I ran this against, it was an early version of MySQL 5.1. It was actually ignoring the straight join hint and it was reordering. So you can see that instead of joining film to film actor, um, to actor, it's joining actor to film to film actor. It's a different order there in the table column, uh, the, the leftmost column that I'm showing here. So how this query is ex executing is that it's taking some constant and it's looking into the primary key of the actor table. Now there is no where clause that specifies a value in a where against the actor table. But if you'll notice, there is a using clause, and there is a um, there's a join criterion where film actor dot actor ID is equal to one. And what MySQL has done here is it's recognized that the join causes the uh, film underscore ID and the and the actor underscore ID. I'm sorry, uh, I just said that a little bit. Uh, I said that a little bit backwards. Um, it recognizes that actor ID in one table is being held to the constant one, and it recognizes that the uh, the using clause in the last line of the SQL query output causes actor ID to be held as a constant, held to the same value across all of the tables in the join. So that actor ID equals one constant actually gets propagated through the whole query and attached, sort of shared with all of the places in the query that that this constraint might be able to help optimize and narrow down the number of rows that the server is looking for. So that's why there's a constant in the first row of the output. We're looking in the uh, looking in the primary key on the actor table for the value one. And once we found that, then we look into the film uh, table using the foreign key index foreign key language ID. I'm not quite sure why it's called that. I used to know this uh, schema by heart, but I don't anymore. And it's looking for um, the ref there is null, which means that it's not looking for any particular value. And then finally, in the bottom, we have film actor looking into the primary key for uh, two things. First is a constant, so it's that actor again, actor ID equals one. And then the second is a value that comes from sequila.f.film ID. So what we actually see here is the sequila.f.film ID refers back to the previous row, the table that's been aliased as f. So it's whatever, um, 
whatever value for the particular stage that it's in of this join execution is being used to probe into the film actor table and find the next row. Finally, there's a, a couple more columns that come at the end. One is the rows column that explains approximately how many rows MySQL thinks it's going to examine, and this is based on storage engine statistics. There are two function calls that MySQL can make during query execution, um, uh, sorry, during uh, query planning to the storage engine to ask it what is the distribution of rows in your indexes, tables, and how many rows do you estimate are going to match this value. So uh, in, the, in the example that I'm giving here, the WHERE clause specifies a range, film ID greater than 50. And what will happen is MySQL will ask the storage engine, hey storage engine, how many rows do you think you have for a range of values beginning with 50 and ending at infinity? And the storage engine replies back, oh, I think I have about 511. And that value gets used in query execution and optimization in evaluating different orders that might be used for the, for the join, for example. And it eventually comes out into the, uh, the rows value and explain. There's another column called filtered, which shows up in certain cases in MySQL 5.1. And it's very tricky to make it show anything other than all or nothing, 0 or 100. It's a percentage, uh, but it's pretty hard to get it to make a percentage of 50%, for example. I was able to contrive some kind of queries with the help of some of the MySQL optimizer folks. I actually had to write them and ask, you know, I just, I really can't get this to show anything other than 0 or 100. Can you give me a sample query? And we worked on something together. It took a few tries back and forth before we found something that showed, I think it was 51%. But it really, it's supposed to indicate that if something is retrieved from a table or an index and then post-filtered in the server, instead of being filtered in the storage engine, it's filtered in the server with a where clause, it's supposed to be the, uh, the percentage of rows that will actually pass through that filter. But again, in most time, in most cases, yeah, this just really doesn't show you anything very helpful. So there's one last column all the way at the bottom here, the extra column, and this is actually really important. It's got all kinds of values in it that you really need for a lot of different things. A few of the most important ones are using index. This means that MySQL is not going to use uh, any access to anything but an index. So if, if we have a query that's only going to touch rows that are contained within a, a specific index, MySQL can actually do the select against the index instead of involving the table at all. And that's a called either a covering query or an index only query. There's various different terms for it depending on which database server you're familiar with. In the MySQL world, we usually call this a covering query or an index covered query. In PostgreSQL, people will usually call it an index only scan or something like that. Um, so there's different different terminology. But this is a big important optimization, actually. People oftentimes say that a query is running too slowly, and they say, but it's using indexes, you know, it's, it's, the, the query is well indexed, I, I can't think of a better index for it. Um, and their query doesn't show that it's using index in the extra column. And that's really important, because if it doesn't show that, then it's going to look up a value from the index, and then go to the table and look for the rest of the row. And that's a lot of random I.O. back and forth which is very, very slow, especially done a row at a time. So using an index um, and, uh, and not, being able, uh, not having to touch the table to look up the rest of the row is a huge optimization when you can use it. Using where means that after the uh, server retrieves rows from the table or the index, it's going to post filter them with a where clause. In some versions of MySQL, it will say using where when there isn't one. And that's a bug that got fixed um, early in the MySQL 5.1. I think it was maybe 5.1.30 something where that bug was fixed. So you, you'll sometimes see that um, in older versions, and it doesn't really tell the truth. But generally, it will tell the truth. And in my previous example, actually, I had a, uh, a using where here. And that does indicate that the where clause, fill my D greater than 50, is being applied after fetching rows from the film table. Using temporary means that the table is, the, uh, the query is going to do an implicit 
temporary table, one of those invisible temporary tables that's only used internally during the query execution. Using file sort doesn't actually have anything to do with files, it just has to do with sorting some values. They're sorted in memory if they fit into the sort buffer. If they don't, then they're written to files on disk, sorted, and then merged sorted together, and that's where the term file sort comes from. The actual algorithm that MySQL uses is a quick sort, not a, uh, there's, there isn't a sort algorithm called file sort. <clears throat> and there are a couple of different ways that MySQL can optimize and execute sorts. But in general, there is a, a rule of thumb that if you see a using temporary or a using file sort on your query, you might have a potential for optimizing that query and getting better performance out of it. There's also a variety of sort merge things that will come out in the, the using in, in the extra column. You'll see using intersect and um, using sort merge, intersect and union. And what that means is that MySQL can be using more than one index for the query. So let's suppose that we have a, a, um, a query that selects from a table where the ID equals one or the uh, created date is greater than something else. So we have two different criteria on this and they, they're potentially going to use different indexes. MySQL might internally convert that to sort of a union. Select some rows that match the first criterion, select some rows that match the second one, um, jive the two together, figure out which rows satisfy all of the, all of the criteria, and then go and fetch the resulting rows uh, from the output. So this appeared in MySQL 5.0, the uh, index merge optimization. And um, sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it actually is slower than simply table scanning or index scanning and uh, applying a where clause it would brute force. MySQL tends to sometimes underestimate the amount of work that it's going to take to execute these more complicated execution plans. And so it'll prefer them when it really shouldn't when sometimes it can even be slower. Another trick there is to rewrite those queries as a union. Sometimes you can do that much more efficiently. And there are dozens and dozens of values that can go in this column. Um, we could spend a lot of time on this, and in fact, in the book High Performance MySQL, I did spend a lot of time on it. So you can look there, or you can look in the reference manual. There's very good documentation in the reference manual on that. One of the things that I did after I kind of slowly worked my way through and understood how MySQL takes a tree execution plan data, uh, data structure and converts it into a tabular explain output was I figured how to go backwards from that. And I've kind of walked you through some of the rules and guidelines with my little colored boxes indicating where something is reading from something else. And those kinds of rules um, and a whole bunch of other more complicated rules that are very difficult to explain and difficult to understand are written into a tool called PT Visual Explain. And I wrote this really because I wanted to see if I could format MySQL's explain output, something similar to what I was used to with Microsoft SQL Server. This was back in 2006 and I was really missing SQL Server's nice execution plan um, formatting and you know it, it was kind of a painful transition for me learning how to optimize queries in MySQL. So I wanted to see if I could generate something similar for MySQL and indeed that's what this does. If you're familiar with SQL Server's table formatted output for an execution plan, I'm sorry, not, not table formatted but uh, hierarchical tree formatted, that's actually what this, this uh, screenshot is doing here. So this is our familiar join against film actor and actor and film. And you should read it from the bottom, from the leaves of the tree up. So we see that it begins with an index scan against the actor's primary key all the way on the bottom of the screen there. Looks like it's going to fetch an estimated 200 rows from that. And then it, uh, it feeds those upwards into a join. The join does an index lookup with those values. The index lookup probes into the film actor table, the primary index there. And it retrieves an estimated 13 rows there for, for every uh, row that was fetched from actor. And then finally, the, uh, the result of that goes up all the way to the topmost join there, where it's used for an, a unique index lookup into the film table's primary key. 
and we, we know that that's a unique index lookup and there's a, a maximum of one row there that can come out of that. So this may be easier for some of you to use. Um, I do have plans to create the, an online tool that will do this in the future and make it even easier to understand what's happening with the query. For right now, I think this is the best you can get to a tree formatted explain plan. There are a couple of more advanced kinds of explain that you can do, and these MySQL has been supporting um, over the years, starting in MySQL 5.0, we got explain extended. So you can say explain extended, type the rest of your query, and then after you run explain extended, it'll look normal, but then um, you'll notice on the bottom it'll say one warning. And if you say show warnings, it will show you sort of the internal representation of that query. And sometimes you can see it's very interesting how the server has reordered and optimized and combined different things. And you can see some of the optimizations that the server does to the SQL that you input. So it can help you to understand kind of how the query gets transformed as it goes through the server. Explain partitions arrived in MySQL 5.1 with the addition of partitioning as a feature. And uh, it adds an extra row, or, or sorry, it adds an extra column to the uh, explain output. It's the partitions column, which you can see after the table column here. I created a trivial little table here and put some, uh, put some simple data into it. It doesn't even have any indexes. The only thing it has is three partitions, a partition 0, partition 1, and partition infinity, which holds all the values uh, less than an infinity. And if I select star from the table, you'll see that it's accessing all three of those partitions. What this shows is which partitions the MySQL server is able to, to prune out. In this case, it's not able to prune out any partitions, and it's going to have to examine all three of them. If we add a WHERE clause, where A between 10 and 99, then that restricts it to only one of the partitions. And in this case, we can see that it's only accessing partition P1. So if you're, um, if you're dealing with partition tables, explain partitions is your friend. Unfortunately, it's not possible to say explain partitions and explain extended at the same time. They're mutually exclusive, so you can only say one of them or the other. Um, but you know, explain is explain it one way and then explain it the other way if you need to to learn uh, more about your query. In MySQL 5.6, which is in development milestone releases at this point, um, and you can get them from the MySQL Labs website. I think it's lab.mysql.com, although it might be labs plural. You can download uh, what's going to be the next release of MySQL, and it has a lot of really nice features in it. Oracle has done a fantastic job. Um, they've done a lot of changes to the optimizer, also a lot of changes to replication and a whole bunch of other things, but there's particularly interesting improvements here in diagnostics. And um, Explain executes differently. Um, it doesn't materialize those derived tables, and it, it doesn't fill a temporary table and then explain the outer query against it. So those, those explains that might take you a long time to execute in previous versions of MySQL can sometimes execute instantly in MySQL 5.6. Uh, you can also explain update, insert, and so forth. That's really, really nice. You can, in the future, um, there's, I don't think that, that this has arrived in any of the lab releases yet, but they're working on an explain that's not formatted as a table. So in the future, hopefully, we'll get something that's formatted either more readably for humans or for computers or both. So I'm really looking forward to that because let me tell you, writing the tool to, to reverse engineer an explain plan and figure out the hierarchy was very, very difficult. <laughs> I, I, um, in fact, some way, sometimes the only way that I can figure out how that stuff is done is I go back to the test cases for the, that tool's test suite and I examine the test cases and figure out some of the subtleties. So I'd, I'd really love to have a machine consumable explain format. I think that's a fantastic improvement. Optimizer trace is a related improvement here that uh, you can turn on optimizer trace, run your query, and then select from an information schema table, and the output comes out in JSON format. It is intended to be machine readable, so this is definitely for tools to consume. It's extremely verbose. Um, it's human readable because it's JSON, but um, it's really probably more intended for computers and for, for tools to, to, uh, to read. And it explains all of the phases that the optimizer goes through. So explain shows you what it thinks the, that the query is going to execute. Explain 
um, uh, the, the optimizer trace feature shows you exactly post-mortem why the optimizer made the decisions that it did. And it, you know, all of the alternative join orders that it considered and all of the alternative indexes and all of those kinds of things. And, you know, I didn't choose this one because that one had a better index cardinality, all that kind of stuff. I've got a couple of links here so you can find out more on MySQL 5.6. One of those is a slideshow from Mark Leith, who's one of Oracle's longtime support engineers, and the other is from um, one of the uh, uh, server developers. So there's good information there on what's coming in MySQL 5.6. Can't wait. We've got a couple of slides of resources here for further learning. High Performance MySQL, again, this is my book. Uh, very proud of this. The third edition is a huge improvement over the second edition and very happy that I was able to do that. You should be able to get it in a few weeks. And if you go to hypermysql.com, you can click through to Amazon and pre-order it there. Also, Percona runs training courses uh, in major cities worldwide pretty much on a continual basis and you can see upcoming courses on our website, percona.com slash training. We run Percona webinars um, what, twice a month or so at this point. Um, those are scheduled pretty routinely. We've got a couple of them upcoming. And there's Percona Toolkit, which has the PT Visual Explain tool that I mentioned to you. This is free software. It's, it's GPL'd um, open source. And you can download that and all of our open source software from percona.com slash software. And then there's another set of tools. I, I've, for a long time, have been creating command line tools such as Percona Toolkit. And now I'm beginning to create tools online, uh, web interface. It's, it's really nice to be able to use a graphical interface for certain things. We have two tools on tools.percona.com right now. One of them can help you generate a MySQL configuration file for a server easily. And then there's another one that can give you advice on patterns in your SQL. It's sort of like a lint check, if you're familiar with that, from um, source code compilation. And I have a... Uh, slide here that shows a screenshot of that SQL query analyzer. So here I've got a, a subquery that doesn't execute well and um, it's also got an advisory against using select star because that's kind of something that a lot of DBAs like to catch and try and eliminate in their queries. Uh, but if you click on either of those rows of advice at the bottom, they'll expand and give you more of a description. I can't demonstrate that here in, in a slideshow, of course, but tools.percona.com. Lots and lots of people have been using that and tweeting nice things about it, so it looks like it's pretty helpful for people. And then the final resource, uh, which I encourage everyone to come to, is the annual MySQL conference, which O'Reilly has run for the last, oh, I don't know, six or eight years, and they're not running it anymore, so we are this year. It's the same conference that it's always been, the one big MySQL conference every year for, for all of the users of MySQL all the partners, all the commercial vendors, everybody in the whole ecosystem is coming together in the Santa Clara Convention Center in Hyatt. It's a huge place and we've rented all of the familiar rooms and uh, organized the conference the same way that it's traditionally been organized over the last several of years. So we'll have all of the familiar things like keynotes and the community awards and the, um, the birds of feather sessions and all of those kinds of nice things. So everybody who's involved in MySQL or uses MySQL in any way should be either coming to this conference or sending your uh, sending the team members to the conference if you're not able to come. It is uh, it's like nothing else, and this is where my career got started really. Some of the featured speakers along the bottom here got pictures of Peter Zaitsev, Sarah Novotny, Jeremy Zawadny, who wrote the first edition of High Performance MySQL. Martin Mikos, the former CEO of MySQL. Brian Aker, MySQL's Director of Architecture, who's now a fellow at, uh, at Hewlett Packard. We have a lot of luminaries there. Um, eight consecutive tracks, I'm sorry, eight uh, concurrent tracks of, of content. And um, my contact information, I'm very happy to have conversations with you. Uh, my, my Twitter handle as well, if you find it easier to ping me on Twitter about something, delighted to have discussions about any of this stuff. I'm a, a geek at heart, and I love to geek out on the technical kinds of things, as well as the administrative or business-related side of things. So that's all I've got. And uh, Terry, did we get any questions as we went? I didn't see any. Yeah, we're uh, right about at the end of time uh, now, but we do have a couple questions. Um, okay. Uh, the first one was, uh, is, is there a way to know uh, the, the actual executions using the explain show function? 
I'm not quite sure how to answer that, but there's, I, I guess you're asking whether, uh, you're referring to my comment that the explain plan is an executed, uh, is an estimated execution plan, and there is no ironclad way to know exactly how it was done. What you really need to do is learn in depth how MySQL optimizes and executes the queries, and then you can use explain to help you understand which alternatives it shows. But when you understand how MySQL's optimization and execution process works, uh, you can actually figure out for yourself how it was how it was executing. There's a lot of information in High Performance MySQL book about that, by the way. Okay, good. Um, also, are uh, invisible temp tables almost always my my ISAM? The invisible implicit temporary tables are created as memory if they can be, um, and if they're not if it's not possible to create it as a memory table, then it is my ISAM. Also, if a if a temporary table is created as memory but then gets too many rows in it, doesn't fit in memory anymore, it gets converted to a my ISAM table on disk. And the things that cause a temporary table not to be created in memory are typically blob or text columns that are uh, too long to fit into MySQL's um, fixed row format for temporary tables. And in Percona Server, we actually have lifted part of the restrictions on that with a uh, a memory engine that can handle varying length columns. Um, so we've got halfway there. It, it doesn't work for implicit temporary tables yet, but that's next on our roadmap. Okay, very good. Well, uh, Baron, thanks for your presentation today, and uh, thanks for everyone who attended. Uh, as I mentioned, we will send out a link to a recording of the webinar um, either today or tomorrow. And uh, please uh, go to the webinars page on percona.com and sign up for future webinars. Thanks, and have a good day, everyone.